You guys really are, though. You're the MVPs. You're, you're what makes this happen, man. This is a, a church full of people who live to give. Um, this isn't a one-man thing. This isn't just the five people that you see up on stage making this happen. This, this is happening, and the lives that are being changed here are being changed because of every single yes that's represented in this room. So thank you, everybody in here who just stood up. And for those of you who didn't, maybe it's time for you uh, to join a team and to get involved and to be in a small group or, or anything like that. But we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But uh, right now, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. We're going to be in verses 9 through 16 today. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 16. Uh, we're going to start kind of at the end of verse 9, the last sentence in verse 9, uh, but this is, this is what it says, and this is Paul talking to the church of Corinth. He says, you are God's building, and because of God's grace to me, I've laid the foundation like an expert builder, and now others are building on it as well, but Whoever's building on this foundation must be very careful because no one can lay a foundation other than the one we already have, which is Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation, they may use a variety of materials. They might use gold, silver, or jewels, and they might use wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. Uh, if the work survives then that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, then the builder will suffer great loss. Now, the builder will still be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? Today, I want to talk to you guys on the subject, and this will be our title today, Buildings and builders. Say that when we say buildings Buildings. and And builders. builders. Now, not to get too sentimental, but speaking of buildings, next week is our last ever experience in this building. That's a little bit emotional. Um, Some of you, maybe that's a good emotion. Some of you, maybe that's a sad emotion, but our Christmas experience is here next week will be our last ever, and I do want to make sure that you know that they're going to look and feel very different from what we're used to, because after the 3 p.m. moving session today, um, a lot of things will be gone, and the building, the way that it looks now, it's never going to look this way again. So look around. Soak it all in. Never going to see this again, but While you're looking around and while you're enjoying this experience today and while you're soaking all this in, I want to remind you that while this building holds lots of great memories, that what God is doing here now and what God's done here in the past, I got a a feeling on the inside of me that it doesn't even scratch the surface of what God wants to do in this church in the days to come. Does anybody else believe that, man? I came here to encourage you guys today. That for Overflow Church, the best is yet to come. And if you believe that, why don't you make a little bit of noise in McKenzie, Tennessee this morning? I believe it, man. Our best days are in front of us. We got good memories, but the best is yet to come. And I hope that when I say the best is yet to come, you know that the best I'm referring to, the best, it's not a new building, all right? That's not the best that I'm referring to. Buildings are great. Buildings are fantastic. But the thing is, uh, God doesn't live in buildings. Okay, building. While this Highland campus is about to be freaking awesome, I just use the word freaking in church. Hope that's okay. We're in overflow. I keep saying that every week. I do something that's kind of uh, off color, and I say, oh, it's a word overflow. One day I'm going to do something, and that's not going to be acceptable. I, I, I'm going to say like something I'm not supposed to say, and I'm going to say word overflow, and everyone's just going to look at me like, no, you crossed the line there. But, dude, it's going to be awesome, okay? It's, it's going to be incredible. Some of you, I promise you, you are sincerely not ready for what's about to smack you in the face when you walk into this campus on the 5th. And I can say this, and I can hype it up like this, because I'm there Every single day watching this campus come together and watching this campus take shape. But as high quality and as excellent 
as this building is going to be, I don't want us to forget that the church is not a building or a place. The church has never been a building or a place. The church has always been a people. You are the church. And Paul's doing his best in the scripture to remind us of that. He starts it off the same way that he ends it. He wraps it up. He starts it, ends it the exact same way. In verse number nine, he says, you are God's building. And then in verse number 16, he wraps it up and he makes sure that we know, hey, don't forget, I've said all this, but you are God's temple. He says it the same way at the beginning and at the end. The church is not a, the church is not a structure. The church is is when two or three come together and he is in the midst of those two or three. If, if I got you and you got me, then we got a church, baby. That's what, it, look around, look at the, the faces in this room. That's the church. That's the building of God. And Paul, he's not the only one that supports this concept. When we look in 1 Peter chapter number two, verses four and five, Peter says something really similar. He says, you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He said he was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. He says, and like Jesus is the living stone in God's temple. He said, you also are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. Peter says, literally, you are the individual stones that God is using to build his temple. Now hear me, buildings are great, but like I said a second ago, God doesn't live in buildings. According to God himself, the, the temple that he lives in now is the temple of his people. I want to remind you, the, the building we've been constructing on Highland Avenue for the last three years is not the church. We haven't been building a church. We've been constructing a building. What we've been doing here for the last three years is building a church. This is the building of the church. You are the church. You are God's building. And if I've been reminded of anything through the process of this Highland campus coming together and taking shape like it has, I've been reminded, and some of you who have, who have been a part of this campus, like, like literally physically been working over there, I've been reminded of this. Buildings don't just appear. You, you don't get to walk into a building or you don't get to walk onto a property and just say, and just wish it into existence. That's not how it works. Buildings don't just appear. Buildings are built. Can I get an amen from anyone who's been building the Highland Campus? Man, buildings are built. They're built with time. And they're built with phases. And they're built with seasons. And they're built with good days and with bad days. If you've ever done construction, they're built with successes. And they're built with mistakes every now and then. Buildings are built. They're built beam by beam and wall by wall and room by room. And they're built day by day. And buildings are built piece by piece. And the kingdom of God is no different. According to Peter, the kingdom of God is being built one stone, one person, one moment, and one story at a time. By a show of hands, who has been a part of Overflow Church for all four years that it's existed. I can't raise my hand. Not that many people. Can we give it up for our seniors in the building, though? All right, now by a show of hands, who's been here for three years? Okay, it's growing. Two years. We got our terrible twos in the building. By a show of hands, who's been in Overflow Church for one year or less? Look at that. Can we give it up for our freshmen today? One year, that's me too. I'm right there with you. I've been here, I've only been, actually, randomly, today is actually my one-year anniversary of preaching here. Last year on this day was my first sermon ever at Overflow Church. But if you guys couldn't tell, there are a lot of people who haven't been here all four years, meaning that there are a lot of people that didn't get to see this church get built. And I promise you, if you ask any of the people who have been here all four years, they will tell you this building and the team's that are here and the people that are here, they weren't always here. It didn't always look like this. If you're a first timer today, the church that you see now, it didn't always exist. And it sure didn't just appear one day. You just wake up and oh, here it is. That's not what happened. The church was built. It was built person by person, day by day, week by week, yes by yes. 
Throw up, throw up the slides for me real quick. I want to take us through memory lane. You see that? That is this room right here. You see the little staircase up there? That is our media booth. That is what this place looked like in the very beginning. Go to the next one. Look at that. Look at Josh Crawford. This is before he lost a lot of weight and then he was like athletic. Look at him, man. He's like eating Burger King or something. You never see that. <laughs> this is crazy, man. Go to the next one. That, that was this building. This is kiddos. If you've ever seen kiddos, that, that's what it was at one point. That's crazy. Go to the next one. That's a little bit more. This is all the people that are in there literally building this thing. It wasn't just there. What you see hasn't always been there. Next slide. This was, uh, if I'm mistaken, this was the very first Jesus movement. Look, the stage was there. Isn't that different? They had a big screen up on the wall right there. Go to the next one. <laughs> That's where our sound booth was. In the, in the back of the room so that it could be there and no one could see when they were sitting there. That's perfect. We have this big upstairs place and yet all of our sound equipment is down low. I don't understand that. Go to the next slide. Look at Middleton. He's, I don't even know if he's here today. He's probably on the road traveling. That's him leading worship. I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, one of the first times they've, at this point, they've switched to this side of the room. This is, I love this because I wasn't here for any of this either. Go to the next slide. This is a, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is an interest hangout for Overflow Church because what many of you don't know and need to know is that before this was ever Overflow Church, it was just a college ministry called the Jesus Movement. And out of the Jesus Movement birthed Overflow Church. And so when they began working on Overflow, they had an interest hangout. Hey, who would be, you know, uh, who'd be interested in making this? And these are, these are what they, they sent out. Uh, or maybe they, they hung them up in different stores, or I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how they got these out. But um, this was the September 12th at 5 to 7 p.m. on 9 Broadway Street. Isn't that crazy? Go to the next one. Look, this is the first service uh, of Overflow Church, the first Overflow Church experience in Matthew Page's house. What even is this? Look at little Dylan Crawford there in the back with his little striped T-shirt. <laughs> Go to the next one. Look at this. This is it. That's who you are. That's where you came from. These are your roots right here. Matthew Page's living room. There's the screen. It's his TV that's still there today. Go to the, go to the next slide. Hey, and then there. Fast forward three years through a little bit of drama, through a little bit of ups and downs, and boom, one year ago today, I get to come. And I get to preach my first sermon here. I think there's one more slide up there. I'm not sure. Um, I could be lying, but if there's not, that's fine. Oh, oh, there it was. You went by. It's okay. It was me and some raggedy. Oh, no. That's just another picture then. I'm glad I didn't wear any of those shirts today. I still wear both, both of those, those shirts and jackets um, still. But I wanted you guys to see all that. Because when you see all of those people and those moments and those experiences and those seasons, you need to know that because of all those moments and those seasons, uh, that we get to hear stories like we heard last week of people whose lives have been impacted by all of those yeses, by the early stages, by the, the beginning stages that most people would have never said, oh, this is going to be great. But because of those moments, we got to hear stories like we heard last week. Because of those moments, Overflow Church in the last four years has literally, and I, I mean this very literally speaking, had thousands of people come through these doors. Thousands of people. Let me show you this real quick. Look at that. You see this? Let me get in the light. There we go. These are a whole bunch of first-time guest cards. That's all these are. These, these simply represent every first-time guest that's ever stepped into this building that actually filled out a card. They don't even represent all of them. It's just the ones who were willing to fill out a card, and I'm not even sure if that's like all the ones that have filled them out like in the last six months. Thousands of people have been touched by what's happening here. Thousands of people, man. And that's not counting our online family, the people who've been touched by what's happening online. Every single week, our online content through Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, literally, man, if you, if you average it up, we have tens and thousands of views on this stuff. Tens and thousands of views. Last week alone, the Stories 2019, it's been viewed over 400 times. We've seen hundreds of people get saved. Hundreds of people 
get baptized. Hundreds of people start fresh with God. We've seen hundreds of people serve in a church probably for the first time. We've seen hundreds of people get connected in small groups. And our church is what it is today because of all of those people and all of those moments and all of those individual stones that God used to build it. And you could probably say the same thing for every single one of your lives as well, for all of our lives. Who you are today is simply a product of all the stones that God used to build you into who you are. You're a product of the people who believed in you, and you're a product of the people who left you. You're a product of the good seasons and of the bad seasons. You're a product of the prayers that were answered, and you're a product of the prayers that weren't answered. You're a product of the stones that represent the situations that you celebrate still today, and you're a product of the stones that God used to build you of the situations that maybe you don't necessarily celebrate, right? The situations that you don't always want to talk about. And whether God made every single one of those situations happen or not, whether every single one of those things were his will, the truth is, even if they weren't, he used it all to build you. He used every single one of you to build you into who you are, to build your family into who you are. You cannot look at me right here today. You don't get the Alex Galleon that I am now without all the stones in, of my past that God used to build me, to turn me into who I am. You don't get who I am right now without the stones of me growing up in church, sitting in between my divorced parents, my dad and stepmom on one side and my mom and stepdad on the other side in the same church growing up my whole life. You don't get who Alex Galleon is without the stone of me missing the final shot of my eighth grade county championship in basketball. You, it's a part of who I am. You don't, you don't get me now without going back to the Alex Galleon who was 16 and got a DUI. Now, that wasn't a stone that I loved and celebrated at the time, but it was a stone that God used to build me. Because that stone, it built me into the kid that ended up going to a youth conference in Hamilton, Alabama, where for the first time in my life, I experienced the love of God, and I experienced the forgiveness of God, and I experienced his presence closer than I ever have, and I surrendered my life to Jesus, and I spoke in tongues, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit that same weekend. All of it was stones that God was using to build me into who I was. And then it's my dad being my youth pastor for years, it was a stone. My parents investing into my spiritual life, even when I was an idiot, it was a stone that God used to build. Me moving to Hamilton, Alabama, and living there for eight years, God, through all of those years, he used those stones brick by brick, piece by piece, to build me into who it, it is that I am now. Man, I went there and I grew and I learned. And at the same time, he, he used stones of friends that I gained and friends that I lost. Memories that were good and memories that just sucked. Moments that were awesome, moments that weren't as awesome. He used the stones of breakups and he used the stone of a marriage. And even though some of those stones were hard and they were tough seasons, God used every single one of those things to build me. And I want to make sure you know you, who you are, you did not just happen. You didn't just appear one day. You were built. God built you. For the first time ever, and maybe for the only time for some of you, hold your bicep up like that. It flicks. Look at someone. Just look at someone. Say, I'm built. <laughs> one more time. Hold them both up. Flex on them. Say, I'm built. You're built. You were built. And you weren't just built into anything. That's, that's the beautiful part. You weren't just built into anything. According to God, he is building you into his house. You're being built into the temple of God. And that's so encouraging. Because before Jesus came in and changed the game for all of us, if you look back in the Old Testament and you look at God's other house, the house he had before us, his old house, the temple of the Old Testament, it doesn't resemble us at all. It is nothing like us. Uh, the, the temple in the Old Testament, you got entire chapters in the Bible that are dedicated to the details 
surrounding the temple. It's the chapters that when you're reading the Bible, you skip, you know, 10, ten breaths and, and the height is five cubic centimeters. And you're like, what does this even mean? But it's the details surrounding the temple of God. It's God telling us how detailed and how specific his temple was back then. It took over 200,000 people to construct that temple. Uh, if you measured it in today's currency, it would have taken between three and six billion dollars to construct that thing, man. Every detail of this temple was specific. Who could build it was specific. The material that could be used was specific. Every square inch of every room had to be done in a certain way. Nearly, nearly every part of that building was overlaid in gold, silver, or bronze. The floors were overlaid. And gold. The spoons were overlaid in gold. The wood that was used to build it had to be the best kind of wood. There was jewels and rubies everywhere. The Bible then goes on to say that even the stones, say stones, stones. even the stones that were used to build the temple had to be perfect before they even arrived. They couldn't be worked on once they got there. They had to be perfect before they arrived. Look at 1 Kings 6 7. This is what it says concerning the temple and its stones. And the temple, when it is being built, was built with stone that was finished. Say finished. Finished. Stone that was finished at the quarry so that no hammer or chisel or any iron tool was heard in the temple while it was being built. These stones arrived, the stones for God's temple, they arrived finished. They arrived already built into what they needed to be. They arrived perfect, and they arrived flawless. And the reason that that's so encouraging is because when you fast forward to the New Testament, we find out that God's temple is still, in fact, being built with stones, according to Peter. Uh, But those stones, they are far from finished. They're far from perfect because the stones that are being used to build God's temple now They're not stones of rock. The stones that are being used to build God's temple now are me and you. And Lord knows none of us arrived to Jesus finished and smooth and perfect. Not a one of us came and was ready to be used. But Jesus, he took us anyways. We didn't arrive finished. Man, and the truth is, some of us still got some smoothing out to do. I don't know about you, but I'm still rough around the edges every now and then. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm growing and God is smoothing me out every single day. He's smoothing me out. But I still make mistakes. I still say things I shouldn't say. I still think things I shouldn't think. I still get mad when I shouldn't be getting mad. I'm still a little bit selfish. And yet, because of the blood of Jesus, God chooses to live in me anyways, right? He left his perfect temple, the temple with the beautiful curtains and the temple with the gold and the diamonds and all that luxury. He left that old temple and chose to instead come and live in us, a bunch of rough, unfinished rocks instead. And I'm telling you, man, if that don't get you going, I don't know what does, baby. Who in here is thankful that God chose you to be his building? If you are, can you just give a little bit of thankful praise today? You're thankful, Lynn? I'm thankful, man. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 9 again. It says, you are God's building. All right, we get that. We're God's building. We're thankful. Then verse 10, It says, because of God's grace to me, I've laid the foundation like an expert builder. I want you to notice the progression that's taking place in our scripture right now. Originally, we're referred to as buildings, but then Paul goes on to say, I'm not just a building, I'm a builder. He literally builds on the concept. Yes, we're buildings, but we're also builders. It's why the title today is Buildings and Builders. He said, I'm not just a member of the church. Now that I'm a part of the building, now that I'm a member of the church, now my mission is to go and to build the church. What he's saying is, man, he's happy and it's good to receive the love of Jesus and to experience his grace and to become a child of God. All of that is incredible and is great and it's your first step, but your life does not stop at you becoming a piece or a part or a member of God's building or God's church. God's purpose for your life isn't just you becoming the church. Your destiny is wrapped up in you building the church. You're buildings and you are 
Builders, it's the call of God on your life. It's the last words that Jesus left us with before he ascended into heaven uh, and, sat, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. It's what Josh Box would call the great commission. He's my great commission man out there. We talk about it all the time. Jesus, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. And anybody who believes is gonna be saved. And this is what he's saying. He's saying, yes, you are the church. But now that you're the church, you have a new mission. Your mission as the church is to now go and build the church, your buildings and your builders. It's how this church began, overflow. It's how this whole thing began. There was a bunch of people, 11 to be exact, who were just a little bit bored and done with what church had offered them up to that point. And so instead of whining and complaining and causing problems where they were, they decided to go out and build what it is that they wanted. Man, what, what if we quit complaining about the way our world was and we started going out and building a better one? That's who you are. You're a builder. You don't have to settle for how things are. That's the call of God on your life, to go and to build something for God. We got to go into all the world, meaning not just other countries, you know, once a year and go to Nicaragua and actually go into all the world. Go into your workplace and into your school and into your family and into your community and build the kingdom of God right where you are. That's who we do. That's what we are. We're builders. We, we build families and we build relationships and we build friendships and we build culture and we build teams and we build the kingdom of God and that's never going to stop. That's what we're always going to do. And I don't care if you've ever picked up a hammer or used a saw. I want you to say this with me. Say, I'm, I'm a, builder. a builder. You need to say it. You need to remind yourself of that. That's who you are. It's your identity in Jesus. You are a builder. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 16. I, I want to read some of this again because I know I've passed by some of it kind of quickly. You're God's building. Got that. Because of God's grace to me, I've laid the foundation like an expert builder. You're building your builder. Uh, it says, now others are building on it, but whoever is building must be very careful for no one can lay a foundation out of the one that we already have, which is Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone of everything that's happening. It's always Jesus. It's, it's always been Jesus. It's always gonna be Jesus. It's not about Overflow Church or First Baptist Church or whatever church. It's always about Jesus. That's what it's about, absolutely. We understand it. Then get to verse 12. It says, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, or wood, hay, and straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. And we're all builders. It says the fire is going to show if a person's work has any value. That's a big word here, value. And if the work survives, if it lasts, if it makes it through the fire, then that builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, then the builder will suffer great loss. Now, the builder, he'll, you'll be saved, but you're going to be saved like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. I want to make sure when I talk about this passage of Scripture, because uh, it's, we take it wrongly a lot of times. I want to make sure we know exactly what it is that Paul's referring to here. He's referring to the second judgment that we're going to experience in heaven. Now, most of us understand the first judgment. We get it. We've been to judgment house. We've, uh, we've seen it all. We know what that happens. The first judgment is where every person, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. We're all going to stand in front of Jesus, or we're all going to stand in front of God, and we're going to have to answer for what we did with Jesus. Did we surrender our lives to him? Did we really follow him? Did we trust him? Did we put our faith in him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the Son of God? Because at the end of the day, Jesus is the one that he's the cornerstone of this thing. He's the one that did all the work. He's the one that makes us righteous. That's judgment number one. Now, there's a second judgment coming, though. And this judgment's only for the people who passed judgment number one. I want you to notice that it said in there, no matter what happens in judgment number two, the builder's still gonna be saved. Paul, when he's talking about it, he's not talking about what we did with Jesus in this verse, necessarily. He's talking about the second judgment. And the second judgment 
it's not, we're not going to get judged the second time about what we did with Jesus. We've already gone through that at that point. The second judgment is going to be concerning what we did with our calling. Did you fulfill the purpose that God put on your life? Meaning, when, when we read this, meaning that God has given every single one of us the task to go and to build something. To go build something. And the test is going to be, well, did you, did you build it or did you not? Okay? But the test, he goes on to say, the test we're going to pass through is also going to be this. And, and it's not, did you start it? Did, did you try? The test we're going to have to pass is, did it last? Did it survive? Did it make it through the fire? Did what you build have a lasting value? Now, hear me. We're building a great church, but are we building marriages that are going to last? That's what's important here. We're building a great church, but are we building kids that are going to burn for God when they get older? We're building a great church, but is this thing going to be one and done? Is it going to end with us, or do we have a long-term vision? Are we building something in hopes of possibly leaving a legacy for the generation coming behind us? Yeah, we're building something, but are we building something that's going to last, that's going to make it, or is it just all about us? Is it just all about right now? We're going to build something that's going to last. This week, I asked our ministry leaders to tell me what their craziest dreams were for Overflow Church. Going into 2020, I wanted to know what everyone's craziest dreams were and uh, heard some awesome stuff, the stuff that literally we talk about all the time. My wife will tell you it's probably the only conversation that I'm consistently having every single day. And, uh, and we heard so many great things. We heard uh, dreams about producing albums that will touch millions of lives, and that is definitely a dream. We heard dreams about having campuses in other cities. We heard dreams, of course, about mass salvations, day where so many people are getting saved and baptized on the same day that the floor of our sanctuary is just covered in water. Because there's so many people. We heard dreams about youth conferences where we'll, we'll, we'll reach kids from all over the nation. And while every single one of those dreams are fantastic, the one the, the, when I heard it, it sparked something up in me is when I asked Pastor Josh Crawford his dream. And this is what he said. He said, my wildest dream is that what I'm doing now will be a legacy that I get to pass on to my children. That long after I'm gone, that this thing will still be moving forward. And people will still be experiencing Jesus. And that what we're doing now would last. Well, I heard that and I was like, if that's not the perfect summation of the mission of our lives and even the, the, the mission of this church. And so with that now, the question remains, if we as the church are called to build the church, then what does it take to build a church with lasting value? A church that's gonna always continue to move forward, a church that's going to leave a legacy. And while I know that there's an infinite amount of factors that go into building a lasting church. After having spent the last year watching this Highland campus take shape, uh, I've realized that there are like two ingredients that really stand out in making sure that what you're building is gonna be something that will last. And the first ingredient to building something that will last is this thing called vision. You must have big vision. Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I know some of you are wanting a great family, but if you don't have a vision for how that's gonna happen, then you're not gonna wake up one day and everything has changed, all right? If you want your business to be successful, then you have to have a vision. You gotta be able to see Long term, down the road, what it is you're wanting to do. If you want to grow as a person, then you have to have vision for your life. You got to have dreams and goals and plans. You got to have plans. Look at this real quick. You know what these are? They're the plans for Overflow's Highland Campus. Look at all these things. A whole bunch of plans. You want to know why that campus is a building now? You want to know why we're going to move in there on January 5th? 
Because a long time ago, a couple of visionaries sat down and they actually wrote out some plans. They wrote out a vision. Do you have plans for your life? Do you have goals? Do you have dreams? Are you shooting for anything specific? Or are you just hoping that one day, you know, maybe you're just going to get there and that everything's going to change? Because that's not how it works. You've got to have vision. I tell you, there's a lot of cha- things that we want to change here at Overflow. We talk about it all the time, every single week, about all the things that, man, I wish we could change. We, we, we wish that <laughs> our whole team agrees with this. We wish we had better communication within our teams, that we were better at like telling people like that, that I didn't wait till Sunday morning to say, oh, by the way, we're doing this. We wish we had better communication. We wish we had a better way of discipling people. We want that to grow. We, we wish uh, that, and, and even right now, we're currently working on making our small groups even better so that in 2020, we're going to have the best small groups that Overflow's ever had, hopefully. And, and while we lack a whole lot of things here at this church, I want to make sure that you know the one thing that we are not in lack of is vision. <laughs> we are full of vision. We can talk about it all day long. While we love what's happening here, we know that what we're doing now, what we look like now and how we function now, doesn't even scratch the surface for where we want to go as a church. And so for the next few, few moments, just a few, I want to make sure that everybody in this room is caught up as to where it is that we're going as a church. And some of the vision that I'm going to lay out for you right now, it's not just a vision for 2020. Yet some of it will be. But some of it is really long-term vision. But I want you to hear it all because you need to know the full vision. You need to know what it is that we see long-term down the road. Uh, for me, specifically, this year, it's 2020. Yeah, 220. So I know this is a little bit cheesy, but hopefully it'll stick. For me this year, one of my visions for this church is that we would double, double in the amount of bodies that are located within this group of people. The, the, the amount of people that are getting discipled would be doubled. The amount of people that join this incredible community would double. The amount of people who are stepping into purpose would double. I want to see double the amount of salvations this year than we saw last year. I want to see double of the amount of baptisms this year than we saw last year. I want to see double of the amount of people on teams and double of the amount, the amount of people in groups. I want to see double the amount of people in 2020 go through growth track that went through in 2019. I hope this year that we get to give double toward missions and toward outreach than what we gave in 2019. We want double. We're shooting for double. Not only that, man, we, we, we at some point, Hopefully soon, we want to be able to send struggling couples who are contributors here at the church. We want to be able to pay for them to go through marriage counseling. I'm so sick of being like, man, you need to get a marriage counseling. And people being like, it's not on my insurance. And us being like, oh, true. Good luck. I want to be able to pay for that. I want to be able to say, you got it. You're a contributor. You're on our teams and you're in a group. You go for it. Write your name down. We'll give you 10 weeks on us. I want to be able to pay for that. I want to be able to hire people on staff that belong on this staff so that we can keep doing things better because right now we're about to get to the spot where we're going to hit a cap as to what we can do with the staff members that we have. But if we have one or two more, I guarantee you, y'all have never seen anything happen so fast. I want to be able to hire people that need to be hired. One day, and this is long term from now, but one day we want to produce albums that touch millions of people. We want to produce albums that when you're driving to church, you get to hear your own church in your radio. <laughs> we want to do stuff. We do want to host conferences for men and women and youth all across this region and all across the country. And in case you guys didn't know, we don't just want Overflow Church to be one location. We want to be one church with many locations. We want there to be an overflow in Martin. We want there to be an overflow in Milan and in Jackson and in Union City. Uh, an overflow in Paris. We want to permeate this region with the move of God that's happening right here. And it don't stop there, man. I want to see overflows in different states. I can see it now. Overflows in Kentucky, Paducah, Murray. That's doable. We can do that. We can make that happen. I want to see overflows in Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi. It doesn't stop there. And in case you don't know this, we feel that there's a global calling on this church. Jesus himself, he said it. He said, go into where? All the world. If he said go into all the world, then apparently there's a calling on this church to go into all the world. I want to see overflows in different countries. I want it to touch the world. I want what's happening here to be happening in every city in the southeast. I want it to be happening in every region. I want it to be happening in other states, man. I think, and I think you guys would agree with me. 
that's, that's some long-term vision for you guys, man. I'll tell you what, we don't have a lack of vision. But one thing that I learned quickly throughout this Highland campaign specifically is that vision isn't the only thing needed to get something built. Vision is really important, but if vision was all that we ever had, then those plans would still just be plans. We had vision, but those plans aren't just plans anymore. Those plans have turned into a whole big giant building because one, we had vision, but two, there was investment. If you wanna build something that lasts, you need vision and you need investment. Vision and investment. A vision without an investment remains a vision. A vision without an investment remains a vision. If you got vision for what you want your family to look like, but you're not investing uh, into that vision what's required of you, if you're not investing the time and the intentionality in your family, then nothing's ever going to change. If you got a vision for, and we all have this, if you got a vision for what you want your bank account to look like, I'll tell you firsthand, that bank account isn't changing because of your vision. You know what's going to change that bank account? Investment. You got to invest into that account. If you don't, then your vision's never going to become a reality. If some of you have a vision for what you want your body to look like this summer, then without proper investment in diet and exercise, those abs ain't showing up. You're still going to have the same look that you have right now. It takes investment. Look at uh, verses 12 through 13 again. Paul, he says, anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, or wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. And it goes on to say that the fire will show if a person's work has any value. Paul is saying that if you haven't really invested in what it is that you're building, it's going to show. If all you invested was wood, hay, and straw, then when the fire comes, the hard times come, it's going to burn away. But if you've invested into what it is that you're building, if you've invested with gold and with silver and with jewels, then when the fire comes and the hard days come, guess what? You're going to last. You're going to make it. You're still going to leave a legacy. Aside from this church, anything that God is asking you to do in your life ever, it's going to require a massive amount of investment. It's why Jesus, to his disciples, before they followed him, he said, you better be sure to count the cost because this is going to cost you everything. It's going to take an investment of everything that you had. You guys already know this, though. Anything that comes free ain't even worth having most of the time. It's why you learn to value money way more when you work for that money. It's why we're so pushing everybody to get invested on a team and to get invested in a group and to tithe because the truth is you only value what you invest into. When someone gave you a car, and you're, you didn't value that thing, but when you bought that car, all of a sudden now you're vacuuming it. You're washing it out. You're not letting people keep their cups in there. You're changing the oil. I know when you invest into something, that's when you value it. See, our, our, our new building, it looks the way it does right now because it had investment. There's contractors that invested time and energy and labor. There were people from this church who were our free contractors. They volunteered literally weeks of their time investing into this building. And to put it very practically, there have been hundreds and thousands of dollars invested into that property. Through this campaign alone, some of you guys are about to freak out. Through this campaign alone, not counting today, we have raised over $123,000 to go toward that campaign. The funny part is, we told y'all in the beginning, when we had our first vision night on September 22nd, that's when this campaign started, that... If we could just get 40,000, we'll be able to make it. To be honest, but like, but really honest with you, we thought that 40,000 was like, oh yeah, that'd be more than enough. We were off just a little bit, like 30,000. <laughs> we were way off because we, we could have never expected the massive amount of investment 
that was going to go into building what God was asking us to build. And I promise if you ask anyone that's been here for four years, they'll tell you that when this thing started, they had no idea the amount of investment that it was going to take. They had no idea what it was going to take of them. But I guarantee you, they'll all say that that investment was worth it, that the hard conversations were worth it, that every minute was worth it, that every penny was worth it, that every lost friend and every rumor was worth it. And why was it worth it? Because that that investment caused that vision to come to life. That investment is what made their vision happen. Investment is what turns vision into reality. Investment is the force. Due to the investment of so many people over so many years, now we get to, right now, we get to see people get saved. We get to see alcoholics get set free from alcohol. We get to see people who are depressed experience hope and joy, probably for some of the first times in a long time. We get to see marriages restored. We get to see multitudes of people encountering the love of God because of an investment. And collectively, we're going to continue seeing that happen every week and every year. Why? Because you and me, we're going to keep on building. And we're going to keep on investing. And even if it's one piece, and one stone, and one brick, and one person at a time. We're going to keep going little by little. In 2019, we've invested so much into a building. And that's not bad, okay? Hear me. And it was all for a purpose, and that purpose was not just so that we could have a cool building. In 2019, we invested so much into a building so that in 2020, we could continue investing so much more into the church. Man, that's that's what this thing is all about. It's our mission statement. Here at Overflow, we live to give everyone the chance at a fresh start with Jesus and his church. We live to give everyone the opportunity, regardless of, of their age, of their race, of their gender, of their background, of their walk of life. We live to give everyone an opportunity to encounter God and to step into the purpose of their lives. That's who we are. That's what we do. That's who you are. We are Overflow Church. We live to give. That's what this is all about. It's what it's always been about. And when we're doing this all over again next year, on Live to Give Sunday 2020, and you're sitting in those one-year-old chairs that aren't green, and on that one-year-old floor that's getting cleaned this week, and in that one-year-old auditorium, and you're looking around, and you're not noticing, you're not recognizing the faces that you see anymore. And, And when you start noticing that all of the sudden, There are a lot of other faces in here and there's a lot of other people that have been rescued and there are a lot of other families who've experienced restoration Then, when that day comes, you'll get it. You'll understand why it's so important for us to be buildings and builders. You'll understand the importance behind big vision and then you'll understand the importance behind your investment into that big vision. You'll get it, man. We all will. We'll get why investment is so important. Investment of our time, investment of our passion, investment of our energy, investment of our good attitudes on the bad days, investment of our willing hearts, and yes, I know some of you are waiting for it to come. Occasionally, investment through our finances. And so what we're going to do today as a church to end 2019 on our first annual Live to Give Sunday before our Christmas experience, before our last ever experience in this building, one last time this year, one last time in 2019, we're going to rally together and we're going to bring our finances and we're going to give them in faith for what God is going to do in your families and for what God's going to do in your lives and for what God's going to do in your city and for what God's going to do in this church in the year of 2020. Let me encourage you. Today, we're not giving as a last-ditch effort to finally raise the amount that we need for the Highland Campus. That season is long gone. 
We've raised that. We're there. We're good. Today, that's not what's happening. Today, when you give, whether you're giving to the Highland Campus and you're ending out your pledge or you're just giving a special offering or you're just giving your tithes and your offerings, today, I just want you to give in faith. I want you to give toward what you want to see God build in you and in your family and in your life in the year to come. And I want you to give knowing that God's not just going to build you, but that he's going to use you to build. And today... He's going to use you to build with your finances. And when you give today, know that we're not giving just toward a building. We're giving toward lives. We're giving toward marriages. We're giving toward people experiencing freedom and forgiveness. We are giving toward people who are going to be built. We are building so that others can be built. As we prepare to give today and, and to bring some faith-filled offerings, as you're making out checks or you're getting your phone out to do it online or you're getting your cash ready, I want to make sure that you guys know, because this is what we're going to do in response today. We're going to end off today in a move of faith. There are four ways to give here at Overflow. You can give via our website, our app, you can do text to give, and if you're giving via cash or check, we want to encourage you to use the envelopes located on the seat behind you. And today we're going to give a little bit differently than we normally do. Normally we give with the baskets that get passed from row to row. But today in the name of giving in faith, which we always want to give in faith, hear me. But today I specifically want to make sure that we're giving in faith. And you guys have heard me say this before, but faith requires movement. And so today... Instead of just passing the baskets today, what we're going to do is all of us, we're going to come forward and we're going to give. Right down here up front, right down here at the altar. And what our ushers are going to do, and they're right here, you guys will see them. They're going to start right here. And they're going to usher you guys row by row. We'll line up right here, row by row, and you'll exit that side. And they'll help you guys out with this. But when you exit, I want to make sure you don't exit the building. Just exit back to your seats because what we're going to do through this whole moment is we're going to worship together through this moment. We're going to worship together in honor of what God's done in your life this year, of what God's done in this church this year. And then at the end of this experience, once it's all over, we're all going to take a big hat with these pictures on in honor of the miracle that we've seen God accomplish in this church this year. So if you guys are ready, would you stand up all over, your, uh, all over the room?